actually like our um Just like, I'm pretty sure we have the same name anyway, and then our name came up and then we were like, we were like, and then it still worked out after the actual name, but yeah. I just didn't get it. Well, it doesn't get it. I know, you go get like the, just like the song for every word and put it over the word. Yeah, it's like the dollar. Notice that your function has to be both continuous and differentiable. That's why we spent so much time in chapter 2 talking about how to tell a function is continuous and how to tell it's differentiable. Because almost everything we learned about, like, those will apply. If it's continuous, if it's differentiable, then we can say these things. So you have to kind of keep that in the back of your mind as you're doing it. But if it's continuous and differentiable, we can say that if the derivative is greater than zero at every point on your interval, then it will be increasing on that interval. Think about what derivatives are, or slope, right? If your slope is positive, does it make sense that your function is increasing? Yes. And if your derivative is less than zero at every point on your interval, then you will be uh, decreasing on that entire interval. And again, think about slope. Slope is negative. Um, then that means um, it is decreasing. You don't need a graph to do this. You just need a function and a derivative, and you can tell me all the intervals where your graph is increasing and decreasing. So now, think about what this can help us talk about. Where on our graph does your function change from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing? What are those points called? Local and streamer points, right? Like local max and local min. Which means if you could tell me where it changes from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing, do you agree you could tell me where your local maxes and your local mins are without needing to graph it and check every time? Okay. Remember how last week we had to do the calculators? It's like, how do we know which max? How do we know which min? Okay. Local extrema. Alright, so let's do one of these. No calculadora is needed. Una calculadora. La calculadora. Donde es biblioteca? Wow, it's like 
And the intervals where the function is increasing and decreasing? It is a parabola, which means it kind of gives us a clue, right? Which way would this parabola open? Which means when we find our critical point, it probably should be a minimum because we know that parabola, right? So that's kind of helpful. It would actually be an absolute minimum uh, because we know that for sure that this is a parabola. We didn't know for sure, then we might have to just say uh, local. So let's just start like we've been doing. Let's uh, take the derivative. And I think that derivative is 2x minus 1. And then what do I do to find my critical point? <coughs> Set it equal to 0. And I feel like we're so advanced, I can do this all at once. I'm going to add 1 and divide by 2 and say that that is x equal to 1 half. Is this undefined anywhere? Which means this is my only critical point. And because it's a parabola, we know that parabola opens up like this, right? So we could even go ahead and say that we know that there is a minimum at one half. How will we find the y value that goes with that? Plug it back into the original. I'm like a frack. Do fractions on your graphic calculator? No. Okay, anyway. Let's just go without a graphic calculator then. That would be 2 fourths, and what would 12 be as fourths? 12 times 4 is 48. Um, 48 and 2, they're both negative, so that would be like negative 50, but plus 1. Would be negative 49 fourths. Oh my gosh, I did fractions on the calculator. How terrible. Okay, there it is. Well, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. I think there's space for the calculator. So we want to look where our derivative is positive and negative. So what if we just say, where is our derivative greater than zero? And where is our derivative less than zero? Could I plug that derivative over there? The derivative was 2x minus 1. Yes, no, maybe. It's still going to be 1 half, right? When I solve that for 0. It's just going to now be x is greater than 1 half. And when my derivative is greater than 0, that means what's all happening on my graph? Less than minus one, then we'll go back. Less than zero, x is less than one half. Right, you with me on that part at least? What's the point of this? Let's go back one page. Wherever your derivative is greater than zero will be where your graph is increasing. Wherever your derivative is less than zero will be where your graph is decreasing. Which means it says give intervals where the function is increasing and decreasing. I could say because of this, I know my graph is increasing in these days. That's because I'm recording. It's increasing from one half to where does it stop increasing? Think about the shape of our graph that we know, right? To infinity! And it's decreasing from where to where? Negative infinity to one half. Notice I didn't include the one half. Um, it's kind of, I don't know. It's, there's this whole big debate in the calculus world of do you include the point where it changes from increasing to decreasing or do you not include the point? And the, the answer is it kind of really doesn't matter on the AP test they would count either one. Like you could say it's increasing from one half to infinity and it's decreasing from one half to infinity, including it. 
and they would count that right as they would count right if you just put parentheses around it. On a multiple choice question, they'll either use all parentheses or all brackets for all the other choices. So you like you never have a choice of both this and this at the same time to confuse you. And so I tend to use parentheses a lot, but I'm sure at some point I'll use a bracket and then someone will be like, hey, why'd you use a bracket this time? And the answer is, it's just this big whole debate in calculus of do you include it or do you not include it? I don't think you should include it because if we think about it's increasing, hmm, it's decreasing up to one half and then it changes to increasing. To me, at one half, what is it? It's exactly zero. So to me, I think you shouldn't include it but you might look in the back of the book and they might include it. And so I just want to have that conversation, which I'm sure we'll have over and over again as we go along here. No, on the free response where you write your own answers, they give you credit for both ways. Like, there's no right or wrong answer, like parentheses or brackets in terms of increasing and decreasing. Okay? Um, let's look at another one, uh, maybe where we don't know already that it's a minimum. Because we knew this one already. If we didn't know this one, we could kind of draw this out ourselves, right? Like we could say, okay, if we have one half right here and we know it's decreasing and then increasing, hey, we know that's a minimum. And that's kind of the new, oh my gosh, that's a big deal in calculus. Um, we're talking about x values here, right? So it really is. This is one half, and this is my x values. Do you agree negative infinity is like this value? And so we, when we say it's decreasing from negative infinity, we're not talking about the y values. We're talking about no matter how um, negative you get on the x axis, that it'll still be decreasing on that angle. Does that make sense? So we're talking about x values here, not y values. That's right. Same direction. take my derivative. What 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 am I doing? Sorry, I'm sorry. Zero. I was trying to write this already. I'm sorry. Greater than zero. That's what I was trying to write and I just screwed up. Don't forget, we'll move 
Before I give you the homework today, I want to go back and look at that multiple choice and show you I really don't know what I'm talking about. Remember from Friday? It's been bugging me. Well, I figured it out in the middle of class, and I just felt like an idiot, and I didn't even want to tell you right then that I was an idiot and go backwards. So I'm hoping that you just forget, and then we can just start fresh. I know, but you'll forget all the other rubbish that I said, and is what I'm hoping. Right, and there was not one of those things. When we try to solve this, it's kind of weird, right? Because you still think, like, it's never going to equal zero, so how can we figure this out? But think about um, no matter what values we plug in for x there, think about what's going to happen to that problem. Because it's a constant, negative 2 over x squared. Do you agree that x squared is always going to be positive? Yeah. So no matter what I plug in there, is this going to be always greater than 0 or always less than 0? Or sometimes agree with that? Like, if I plug in, no matter what I plug in here, it's still going to be a negative over a positive, so it's never going to be greater than zero. Does it say never? Oh, you better just prepare to waste lots of paper. We have to add in the first derivative test and the second derivative test and lots of, lots of stuff. No, but before we have the test, in fourth grade, we spend three days on it, plus a worksheet. Yes, you will. This is always going to be negative. Does it make sense that if there's no extrema point, then your graph is either going to be always increasing or always decreasing? Because the only time it changes is if there's a point, like a max or a min. So that kind of verifies that there is no extrema point. Um, so we're supposed to give our intervals of increasing and decreasing. So we would say it is increasing never. Here's the question. Can you say it's decreasing from negative infinity to infinity? Because what's the domain of that function? Is the domain of that function negative infinity to infinity? So we can say there's two ways. I think the easy way, okay, you're right. We could say it's decreasing in how I wrote it, negative infinity to zero. Zero to infinity. Or you could say it is decreasing over its entire <laughs> domain. That's the, the, the tricky way to get around actually having to write out the domain, <coughs> right? <laughs> Again, we didn't need a calculator to do that. Hooray! <laughs> Let's see what else I have. I don't have any more on here, so let's see. This is my favorite thing right here. Oh my goodness. I know, I forgot already. I'm excited now, though. It is important. It makes next semester at the beginning super easy because they reintroduce this like it's a brand new thing. And all they do is instead of calling it antiderivative, they throw in a new word. And then you have to put your students in categories of low, medium, or high. High meaning like they're likely to get credit, medium, uh, not sure, low meaning not likely to get credit on the ACT. And so then you can take their scores and look how you rank them. And if you have a whole class full of low kids and, and then you get two or three attacks, then it looks like you did a great job. But if you have a whole class full of high kids and only two or three attacks, then it looks like you did a crappy job. So you rank the whole thing. And so <laughs> the idea is you want to make, you want to rank people as, as low as possible. But I use, um, here's my evidence that I use. Pre-cal grades, um, 
their grades on your current test that we've had in here, homework percentage completion of uh, like how much homework you've completed, um, and oh, and the AP potential, which when you took the PSAT, based on your PSAT score, it said what what classes you were likely to do well in uh, AP. And so if you have AP potential and you did okay in pre-cal, then like I have to rank you high because that means like you should do well. But only two of you had AP potential. Can't hurt as much as you guys making fun of me for singing. <laughs> Pretty sure you were laughing at me more than with me. Um, we're just going with it. We're going. We're just going with it. This is the derivative. I want the original function. So think about if the derivative is sine of x, what original function would have a derivative of sine of x? Negative cosine of x, right? So, and I'm just going to use all lowercase s here. The definition, they always use capital and lowercase. I don't like that. Sometimes they're going to use g of x even. But if this is f prime of x, then I can write the original as f of x. And I can say that's negative cosine of x. And the great thing is you can check this, right? What's the derivative of cosine? Negative sine and a negative and a negative would cancel out to be a positive. But notice it says find all possible functions because it's a little tricky sometimes. What if I had, a, what if the original function was negative cosine x plus 7? Would that still get me a derivative of sine of x? What if I had plus 9? Would that still give me a derivative? <laughs> what if it was plus 91? What if it was plus 191? <laughs> so we need to show that we could add any constant to that and it would still give us the original, right? So how do we do that? We say plus a big C here. And C means Yeah. Why not to be? Is this the same thing for all 
the original function of this. Yeah, you gotta think about your uh, rules, right? So think about... Mm. If this is x squared in the derivative, what did the original one have to be? It had to be cubed, right? Or think about we could put that back up there, right? Not gonna multiply, though. That would be x Cubed. If I took the derivative of x cubed, would I get 3x squared? And again, they're going to be pretty standard on these today because we're baby stepping it. Minus, what would the original function be to get you 2x? x squared, because you could just say that's 2x. Plus x. Plus c. Don't forget your c's. One time on our integration test in calculus in high school, I forgot my plus c. And it's the only thing I missed on the whole test, but I missed it like five times, and I was really mad. So, so all I missed was plus C. I got everything else right. You just took it on Friday. Yes, Friday. Well, they tried. Friday. I need to take it home because I grade all the retests together, and there's people still taking retests. They want day, so I won't grade next. I probably won't grade this till tomorrow. Someday you're going to go to college and you're going to realize you don't have to write everything out when it's just for you and your notes. But you can spell it the right way if you want. Don't tell me it's algebra. Right. Right. <laughs> so uh, what else do we do with this? Instead of asking you to find all the derivatives, they can give you a point so you can actually find what that constant value is. Um, and so that's the difference here. It says find the function with the derivative of f prime of x equals 2x plus 1 minus cosine of x that passes through the point 0, 3. Step 1 is still find the original function first.
So I don't get crazy here until next semester. Next semester, we get lots of crazy breakfast. Crazy breakfast. Crazy breakfast. Crazy breakfast. Imagine the inverse big one. Can I say the other one? Oh, wait. This is homework four, two, day two. I don't feel like I have enough time for that multiple choice, but we're having a worksheet day tomorrow, so tomorrow I'm going to have that multiple choice ready, and we're doing that first. Rachel. That's terrible. We've only had four days of homework.